Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Prince George's County Memorial Library System's virtual programs. I'm, my name is Nicholas Brown, and I am the COO for Communication and Outreach at the Library. We are located in Maryland in the suburbs of DC, and I know we have many fans of Wills and Bang on a Can tuning in from across the country and potentially internationally, so we're really super excited to host you. Um, the connection with us is that uh, Will is a professor at University of Maryland, which is located within our county here. We're the eastern suburbs of Washington, D.C. Um, from uh, the river down south where National Harbor is up to I-95, if that means anything to you. And if it doesn't, I'm glad it doesn't because it's kind of a 95 is a whole miserable thing. But anywho, uh, we're super excited to uh, be hosting Will tonight. He is a professor of musicology at uh, the University of Maryland, as mentioned, at the College Park campus. And he's going to be joined tonight by Anne Majette, who is, of course, one of the most distinguished um, journalists and writers on uh, music living today. And she's, of course, a hugely important figure in our life here in Washington, D.C., from her former role at The Washington Post as a classical uh, critic, chief classical critic. She is also an author in her own right and has written a book on Leon Fleischer, which was a biography of him, co-written with Leon, who was, of course, um, recently deceased, wonderful American pianist who's based in Baltimore, taught at uh, Peabody. And uh, we are so glad to have Anne as well. Um, just a couple housekeeping things, and I'll give you a bit more of Will's bio and, and some information before we get started. Um, our partner bookstore tonight is Loyalty Bookstores, which is a female, Black, and queer-owned bookstore based in DC and Maryland. So we encourage you to support them and support Will by purchasing a copy of the book at loyaltybookstores.com, and I'll have a link for you in the chat in just a moment. Um, the book is also available through the library, through our Marina, excuse me, Marina system. So uh, visit our website at pgcmls.info and go to the event page for tonight, and we'll have a link up there within a few minutes um, with the direct request link for the book. Um, and just a bit more about uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. For those of you who are not familiar with the, the classical and contemporary music world and the music business here in the U.S., um, Bang on a Can is a really important ensemble that's kind of taken the, the community by storm here with adapting to the different challenges and opportunities in terms of looking at new business models for um, participating in, in the field and the, dis the discipline, especially with the, the strange conditions of um, classical music and new music, depending on private funding and the ex virtually non-existent government funding that exists for this type of art. Um, so Will's take on this is super important. Um, you might have come across his work in a lot of amazing international publications, including uh, the New York Times, many academic publications. Uh, he is on Twitter as at Seated Ovation, and we'll have a link for that up in the chat in a moment. Um, Will's work is super interesting in that, and you know, along with Anne and many others like them, they straddle the world of um, writing for a niche industry, but also writing about those topics for a mass public audience. And Will has really distinguished himself um, both as a journalist as, and in academia um, in kind of bringing more and renewing public interest in some of these very um, scholarly disciplines. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna invite Will and Anne to join us here. I'll be uh, with you on the chat throughout. We'll have a Q&A towards the end of the program. Hope you enjoy. Uh, this program will be available on our YouTube page on demand at uh, youtube.com slash pgcmls. And if you're tuning in and want to do us a favor, if you can share the link of this broadcast, wherever you're watching it from, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, you'll help us reach some new audiences tonight. And we also hope that you follow the library on all of your social platforms. Thanks so much. And give us one moment, and we'll switch over to Will and Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi, Will. Hello. And hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks to the library for, for hosting us tonight. And um, it, is, it is really exciting to be here talking to Will about this book. I feel like I have a personal connection having known Will for a while and haven't been writing about Bang on a Can for a very long time. Um, and then over all of this is, is the specter of my husband, who's now downstairs, who was writing for the Village Voice about the downtown music scene before Bang and I Can came onto the scene and then has written about them also for the Wall Street Journal and other publications ever since. Um, so, well, I wanted to start with a question that I have encountered many times as a music journalist um, writing about Bang on a Can. How do you explain what Bang on a Can is in an elevator pitch to somebody who's never heard of Bang on a Can? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, and you know, it's definitely one of those things where uh, perhaps you need a whole book to explain what's going on. Uh, you know, that's that's the advantage of academics is we, so we get to do that. Um, so, you know, 
I'm getting a little bit of, I'm hearing a little bit of echo. Is that coming? Cause you're looping back. I, Are you on? I can do fine. Okay. Okay. I'll keep going. Um, so bang on a can at its most simple level is three composers, David Lang, Michael Gordon, and Julia Wolf, who in 1987 decided that they wanted to put on a concert in downtown New York. Um, in 1987. Um, and that was a marathon concert bringing together all these different styles of contemporary music. Um, and the idea was they wanted to reach a bigger audience for contemporary music than the time, which at that time it felt like new music was this kind of more um, insular and academic scene. And they wanted to reach beyond that, um, that insularity and reach a broader audience. So they did that in 1987 and they were successful. And these three composers you know, are now significantly older and basically continued putting on those concerts, but continued growing their organization over the subsequent couple decades. They started an ensemble that tours called the All Stars. They started, um, you know, kind of multi-event festivals in the 1990s. They started a record label in the early 2000s, a summer festival for young musicians. And so now it's kind of the sprawling organization that currently is putting on, you know, marathon concerts on online streaming during COVID times. There was one last Sunday. Um, but it's very influential in the world of new music, has always kind of had this scrappy uh, DIY mentality, but has also kind of grown immensely, become really important and influential and and helped kind of make contemporary music uh, more a part of kind of maybe the more mainstream culture in the 21st century. Well done, as long as <laughs> it's a long elevator ride. <laughs> <laughs> and in the other chapters of the book, I explain it, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've run into this for years, telling it to editors who don't know what it is and trying to sum it up. Um, it's, it's Some people see Bang on a Can as the all-stars, the ensemble that plays, some of them as the composers. There's a lot of different moving parts to Bang on a Can. Um, what was your first encounter with Bang on a Can? And at what point did you decide that this was a book for you? Yeah, the, those are two kind of slightly separate things because um, I, I don't necessarily knew that I was going to be a musicologist when I first started re learning about Bang & Cannon. And I definitely not something that I would have thought of to research. Um, but when I was in college, I don't remember exactly when I first heard Bang & Cannon, but I do I do remember probably after reading Alex Ross's book, The Rest is Noise, which was really my introduction to 20th century music and is a phenomenal book if you haven't read it already. I assume anyone listening probably has it on their shelves, hopefully. Um, which talks about some of those composers towards the end of the book. And, you know, around 2007, 2008, I had started listening to some of their music, which goes back to the 1990s. And I, I do remember in, in 2008, I think, when David Lang won the Pulitzer Prize um, for this really astonishingly beautiful piece, The Little Match Girl Passion, uh, he being one of the Bang & Can founders. And so I kind of became, started following them. I became more and more interested in new music in college. I uh, started kind of following the younger generation of composers, kind of the, the post Bang & Can generation, especially um, people like Nico Muley and Judd Greenstein, who were kind of seizing on this broader audience idea that Bang & Can was interested in, and also this kind of cross genre interest, which I hadn't talked about, but was also important um, to them. I went to my first Bang & Can marathon in 2010. Um, it was really fun. It was in the World Financial Center in downtown New York. You know, there's all kinds of different music over, I don't know, 10 or 12 hours. I stayed for the whole thing. And at the end, they gave me the certificate that said I was a new music warrior and, and some free CDs too, uh, which, which felt very good. Um, and then, you know, that was always something that I, I thought was interesting. And as I, um, you know, went to graduate school and started thinking more and more about what I wanted to study, um, they were kind of in the back of my mind as something that was interesting. And as I began to study what I thought was kind of the 21st century new music scene focused on this younger generation of musicians, at the time this was called the, the kind of indie classical scene, um, I realized more and more that Bang & Can was a really important precursor to that. Um, and so I ended up writing a dissertation that was about the kind of post 2000 younger scene. But then when it came time to write a book, I decided let's move back a couple of decades, focus on the 1980s and 1990s and see what that other stuff kind of came from. And also really ultimately what I was interested in this book is to find out what this kind of world was like in that period, um, a period which I didn't know firsthand, but I could kind of reconstruct via, you know, reading the work of music critics like yourself, um, reading archival documents, doing a lot of interviews, stuff like that. Right, right. And I being a generation ahead of you, but a generation behind my husband, didn't encounter Bang on a Can until about 1999 when I came back to New York and they were already right. sort of scrappy downtowners, but there's been two sections of evolution. Now, of course your book 
stops before I get back to New York. You chose right. That's true. Yes. Now, I, I remember reading some of your reviews of Bang on a Can, but also they were beyond beyond the scope, as scholars like right, to right. say. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I, I wrote when they first started their institute, the Summer Institute and things mm. like that. Um, what what led you to want to focus exclusively on the first half of this story? You mentioned that you wanted to write about the 80s and 90s. You partly explain it. But still, as you say in your epilogue, there's a lot of the story left to tell after you end it. Um, talk a little bit about how you came to that conclusion. Yeah, it you know, I say in the end of the book, basically, like, this is maybe just the first chapter, or the first half of the story, but it was also a complete story um, of of a, of the larger, I think a complete story of of the larger story that I want to tell with the book, which is that the book follows Bang on a Can, the, these three composers in the organization that they built from the early 1980s when they were in graduate school at Yale until the late 1990s, which is this point when the organization has become this kind of established entity. Um, They've started doing concerts at Lincoln Center, which was a very big deal at the time. They have a record label uh, contract with Sony Classical, another kind of big deal. They have kind of an established audience. Um, and then in the early 2000s, right, really when I stopped, they start this summer festival that becomes this really important home for young musicians. Um, so that's the kind of individual story of what Bang a Can is doing. And then the larger kind of story that I wanted to tell, which is the story of what I end up calling the marketplace turn. So you know, the subtitle of the book is Bang on a Can and New Music in the Marketplace which is that in the 1980s and 1990s, there was this um, larger shift I see in contemporary classical music in the United States where musicians and institutions, so administrators, were really starting to understand that contemporary music might have some kind of mass appeal beyond fellow specialists, fellow academics, fellow experimental composers, that it could reach some kind of broader audience. And then Certain people in that world are saying, well, I think our music should reach this audience, like Bang on a Can. And then there are other people in that world, for example, people in the classical music world at Lincoln Center or Sony Classical, who are saying, well, maybe we should look at new music's audience appeal and use it as a way to bring people into the world of classical music. And so in the 20 years I kind of cover, it's really trying to cover Bang on a Can within this larger shift that's happening at these upstart institutions, but also these established institutions that's affecting the funding landscape for new music at a national level, what's going on with the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, which is the um, statewide version of the NEA, um, at a time when public funding is being increasingly jeopardized through the 1980s and 1990s, how institutions are responding to that, how new music responds to that, and if we think about, for example, if we go back, you know, 50 or 60 years to the 1950s and 60s, when there was this um, kind of idea that academic, that composers could retreat into the academy. This was very famously articulated by the composer Milton Babbitt in this infamous, infamously retitled essay, Who Cares If You Listen, which was not his original title. And every scholar has to have a little asterisk saying not his original title, but um, that was printed in high fidelity in which he basically argued composers should retreat from the broader public to work in the academy to become kind of scientific figures. Um, and that wasn't, that idea didn't apply to every composer, but it was a kind of prevailing ethos. And the marketplace turn is really the 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 opposite effect. Let's, re, let's move away from the market, move away from the academy and back into the marketplace. And that's the kind of broader story I wanted to, to tell in the book. So sure. that it's, it's interesting because there's a lot of different currents with the marketplace because you're writing about a time when the market for music not just new music, is going steadily down. I mean, you talk about Bang on a Can getting the recording contract. Part of that is as the record industry falls apart, Bang on a Can is one of several organizations that were able to create alternative institutions, in effect. I and mean, that's what your book is about, is Bang on a Can developing its own institution. But um, there was a figure you quote fairly early on in the book. I was really interested. You have two separate citations. One is of the year 1976, when... Philip Glass's Einstein at the Beach sells out. Um, Steve Reich's Music for 18 Musicians sells out Town Hall and then sells 100,000 copies. And what was the other one? Um, oh, Final Alice. David yeah, Del Tredici, yeah. Right. And then you cite the 1990s when Laurie Anderson is on the Billboard charts and Philip Glass is making whiskey ads and the Kronos Quartet is all over the place. And both of those are citing pretty big cases of mass audience, especially 1976, at a time when the serialism thing and the academic music thing is at its height. And 
I question whether Bang on a Can, for all of their admirable audience development, ever reached anything like the heights of Philip Glass, Einstein on the Beast, just for example. Yeah, I, 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 I basically agree with you. Um, you know, one thing that I'm, I'm, I try to do in the book, um, which is tricky, is to say I don't think Bang on a Can is like the most important player in this situation that I'm interested in. I think it's a very representative one. Like, I think if we understand their growth, we can use it as a case study to see the larger picture and the decisions that they're making. Um, and, you know, I set up in the introduction of the book to talk about what, what leads to the marketplace turn is the fact that suddenly in the beginning in the really the mid 1970s and into the early 1980s, there is this awareness that new music can have this big audience appeal. And I think if you mute yourself, it might be uh, the echo. That would be great. Um, so those are excellent. Those are the precise examples that I see on. Like what happens when people suddenly realize that Philip Glass can sell out the Metropolitan Opera or Steve Reich can sell 100,000 records or, um, you know, Laurie Anderson can make it onto the pop charts with a with a kind of experimental single, Oh, Superman. Um, the response to that is, I think, the Bang and Can generation who are aware of that success, want a little bit of a piece of it, wary of some of what I think that they felt as younger composers, they felt some of that was maybe tilting towards the sellout direction, but they want to create an institution that can reach those people. And they do also construct a kind of mythology for themselves that maybe leans on this idea a little too much of like, there wasn't an audience for new music and we helped there be one. Because there was, like Glass and Reich and, and Del Tredici in various ways have demonstrated that there was this possibility um, that Bang on a Can and, and all these other kinds of institutions seize on. Um, so yeah. The, the one question for me is that you were talking initially about Bang on a Can's huge influence on the composers you were writing about in your dissertation. And that is an influence that's about a tremendous musical influence and a tremendous aesthetic influence and the idea of sort of carving out your own turf that is neither in the, the two camps you mentioned of so-called uptown and so-called downtown music. Um, and that had a tremendous influence regardless of the marketplace aspects. I mean, the idea that this music was popular, of course, or populist in some way was a part of it, but I think it was also an aesthetic uh, dimension that was influential. Um, would you agree or do you think that people are much more marketplace focused in the generation that initially led you to bang on a can? Yeah, I think it's both like this is to a certain degree emblematized in this uh, uh, this kind of dirty, dirty word catchphrase of indie classical, which is um, I, I have a whole journal article and chunk of my dissertation that traces out the, the the emergence of this term around 2007, 2008, and how it kind of caught on in the press. Um, it was created by a couple of composers, became this big thing. And then within five or six years, all the composers in the scene that it was used to define kind of pushed back against it and said, "We do this, this is a bad term. It's like a kind of hasty, uh, overinflated summary of what we do. And so the term kind of faded away, except uh, in, Much like in my the term own- minimalism, may I add. <laughs> Minimalism has not faded away, though. But but yes, the, the composers composers do not like terms that define them, except that often sometimes they do. Um, like so, for example, one of the people who came up with indie classical who laser pushed back against it was Joan Greenstein. Um, and uh, anyway, um, indie classical as a term kind of ended up standing for two things. Um, when it was first created, it stood for this idea of a kind of DIY approach that you would create contemporary music outside of the kind of mainstream academic orchestral world, start your own ensemble, start your own record label. That ethos very much goes back to Bag and Can. It also goes back further to, you know, the Glass and Rice generation in the 1960s. Um, the other kind of what indie classical came to represent, which was kind of latent in the original definition and then came out more and more in the press kind of reception of it was, combining indie rock and classical music. And that's what a lot of those composers did, this kind of genre bending, genre crossing, these very kind of uh, cursory words that summarize what's going on in this scene. Um, and it was the two of those things that that came to define what indie classical was. And it's the two of those things that also, you know, were basically defined what Bang on a Can was. Um, you know, Bang on a Can in the 1980s, they first kind of staked their claim on bringing together the uptown academic scene and the downtown kind of minimalist-ish scene. 
In the 1990s, they increasingly talk about more and more once they start this all-stars ensemble, they define themselves as combining classical music and rock. That becomes the kind of paradigm that they talk about themselves in the 1990s. And so something that becomes about kind of cross stylistic things within contemporary classical music becomes about cross genre things. And that's like one of the threads that I kind of follow in this period as well. I was really intrigued to see you write that, that the development of their awareness of rock and their own music is relatively late. And then when it began, it was about the ugly stuff and the contrast and what was it, post ugly music? It was a great mm -hmm. time. Um, but you also write about the, the aesthetic, a sort of unified aesthetic, I think you say, that weaves its way throughout that is called Bang on a Canism by some academics. And I was wondering about that because Bang on a Can is always set out to be so eclectic and trying to give equal time to many different kinds of music. And certainly the marathons have been very eclectic, although in the book you go into how the all-stars sort of evolved in their own direction. Um, how do you reconcile those two aspects of Bang on a Can? Yeah, that's a great point. And it's one of the tricky things when that goes back to the what is Bang on a Can question, because Bang on a Can is three composers who have each developed their distinctive artistic voices that are always represented by their organization, but it is also an organization that curates concerts that are designed to be eclectic in some way. That's the first, the very first marathon, the, the kind of billing that they gave it was an eclectic super mix of styles from the serial as an atonal music to the surreal, um, which is a great little bit of phrasing um, from the publicist that they hired came up with that um, at the time. And so the eclecticism was there in 1987. That was something that they really staked their claim on. They very famously put the music of Steve Reich and Milton Babbitt back to back as a way to show that this kind of academic atonal music of Babbitt associated with this who cares if you listen idea. If you put it next to minimalism of Steve Reich, this kind of downtown thing, these are two very opposing aesthetics in the 1990s and that they saw themselves as bringing those two ideas together or perhaps transcending them or perhaps trying to put aside this binary or complicate this binary. They talked a lot about this idea of kind of embracing the clash between these things in 1987, those two composers apparently um, did not acknowledge each other or meet at the concert because they were both so kind of represented these opposite camps and, and kind of slightly curmudgeonly uh, personalities too. Um, and so that was always part of the Bang & ethos of bringing together things from different styles. But then also these composers, of course, you know, aren't themselves eclectic in the, they're not presenting many different styles of music. They kind of figure out each their own artistic trajectory. Um, David Lang starts off as a very academic composer who's very interested in a lot of the kind of mathematical ideas that are happening in the academy in this period and gradually becomes kind of more influenced by the, the minimalist music and then eventually rock music uh, by the 1990s. Michael Gordon um, starts off, you know, as he's starting to be a composer, he actually has an art rock band in downtown New York called Peter and the Girlfriends, uh, which I have yet to see a music video of, but apparently they do exist and I've been trying to convince him to digitize them and send them to me. Um, it's unclear, they may or may not have a music have had a music video on MTV, I never figured this out. Um, so he's very much in the rock world. He starts his own group called the Michael Gordon Philharmonic, which does this kind of minimalist rock dissonant thing. Um, and that evolves to the 1990s. And then Julia Wolf, um, who's a bit younger than the two of them, starts off writing kind of music very influenced by Stravinsky and Steve Reich um, and becomes like the three of them, I should say, very influenced by the music of the Dutch composer Louis Andriessen, which is kind of one of the central influences on all three of them. And she also in the 1990s really starts to unlock an interest in, in popular and rock music and her music. And that kind of sets her on this pathway. Um, and now all of them write these kind of large scale symphonic theatrical works that sound very different, um, but still have continuities with what they were doing in the 1990s. Bearing out your claim that they were trained in the institution and always were gonna head back to the institution. They have become not only an institution in terms of having bang out a can, but now they are Pulitzer Prize winners and commissioned by the New York Philharmonic and, uh, and all of that. Um, Although I always found it distressing that that shift was marked by David winning the Pulitzer Prize. The Pulitzer Prize still gave him the stamp of um, authority that he needed in order to become the kind of composer he wanted to be. Um, yeah, there's a very complicated relationship in how they navigate whether they see themselves as kind of institutional or establishment figures. It's just something that they continually resist to even today, despite the fact that they certainly represent very influential and I think powerful figures in the world of contemporary classical music. Absolutely. Although I, I feel that 
maybe David in particular, where he really reaped the benefits of that Pulitzer in a way that not every Pulitzer winning composer has. And all of a sudden he was in demand as a, as a teacher at Yale and, you know, getting all these guest professorships and all these big commissions and, and the other two have followed suit. It's been, it's been an interesting thing to see. Um, another aspect of the marketplace, I mean, a lot of the, there's a, a big chunk of the book is devoted to the culture wars of the 1990s and issues of funding and what Bang on a Can was dealing with as, as funding fell. And um, I guess I was curious on uh, about your focus on that and you're thinking of how it fits in. And then I have another part to that question, but rather than keep throwing two part yeah. questions at you, I'll ask the first one first. <laughs> So I was always interested in the funding question, um, in part because I had one early on access to Bang on Akin's internal archives. They basically let me on their hard drive and I could kind of take whatever I wanted. And so I have all these, had all these files of grant applications, budgets going back to the late 1980s, early 90s. And 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 to be able to have that kind of access is, is unusual. Um, for musicologists, you know, it's hard. Did I just lose you, Anne? Oh, I'll just keep talking and hopefully Anne will return. Um, it's hard for scholars to, um, you know, you don't necessarily have access to Beethoven's financial documents or whatever, or even the financial documents of more contemporary composers. Um, and so the, the being able to talk about and kind of trace the funding was always really important. Um, Nick, it did we we lost Anne? I'll 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 be your foil until. Um, okay, <laughs> okay. I hope hopefully she will return. Uh, we miss you already, Anne. Um, uh, so. That was one part of it. And then what, what was really interesting to me was that there was, hi, <laughs> no, that's fine. I was just saying, you know, I got a lot of internal financial information from these documents and that became the first part of it. Um, but there was this kind of macro context happening uh, at the social, you know, the kind of big political developments in the United States in the 1980s and 90s, first Reaganomics and how that affected the NEA, but then also what happens in the late 1980s when the evangelical right, led by Jesse Helms, um, attacks Andre Serrano and Robert Maplethorpe for purportedly obscene art and ultimately attacks the NEA for funding that art, although they were funding it indirectly, the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and so, you know, there's not a clear connection between that situation and the world of contemporary music. And in fact, one of the connections that I was lucky to find was that David Lang writes this essay in the early 1990s in which he basically says, why are congressmen attacking the world of contemporary art? Why don't they care about us co contemporary composers? He's kind of saying like, oh, if only we were controversial enough to get attacked, then wouldn't that be a good sign of our cultural relevance, right? Which is a very interesting statement to make. Um, but the, the indirect effects of the attacks on the NEA in terms of the gradual defunding and then very sudden defunding of the organization uh, which bought, whose budget was cut by 40% in 1995, 96, and which at that time also eliminated all grants to individual artists. Um, so in the past, the NEA had given grants, not just to institutions to then give funding to composers or artists, but they had given grants directly. And this is, I think, something that people don't necessarily understand anymore. Um, the NEA would give out composer fellowships to composers so that they could write a new piece. They'd give out a chunk of money to a composer that they would write a new piece. And this is why, understandably, this is exactly the kind of thing that they had to eliminate to satisfy Congress because you know they were if they were giving a grant directly to some controversial visual artist that would end up being a kind of political problem um and so you know if we follow the world of new music through these funding cuts we see composers institutions attempting to respond whether that means you know putting out political statements which some composers did in the early 1990s or it means basically following the finances of an institution like bang on a can as they get it's not like they relied on public funding. No, no one relied on public funding in, in the United States. It did, that was not a thing. One always had to diversify one's income from donors, foundations, public money in the mix. But public money had a big effect. Um, and so more and more Bang and Can finds these different ways to seek out new sources of income. One of the ways they do so is by starting this All-Stars Ensemble, which they start for artistic reasons, but also because it allows for ticket revenue to be brought into the, to the organization as a whole and it unlocks touring opportunities, new audiences, record label opportunities, all of which, you know, I, I, I have a couple of graphs in the book that basically chart out as public funding is declining, Bang and Can is, is making this new kind of stream of earned income via these other sources. Um, I guess the second part of my question was this idea that um, 
the traditional marketplace was falling, that these this arts funding was falling. But in fact, the arts funding was a relatively recent development. I think you write that NISCA was founded in 1960. When you go back to the 1950s, um, there weren't all these nonprofit organizations yep. because you didn't need them because the market actually did bear them. Um, and if, if you didn't make it in the market, you were not viable. That's why this whole academic composer thing was was a thing because it was a contrast to the idea of being commercial vi commercially viable. And the fact that a composer like Philip Glass is continually being upbraided for selling out, for making a successful living in the way that composers 200 years ago did is an interesting sort of feature of, of our world. I wonder what your thoughts are on that rather than bang on a can um, sort of discovering new ground. It's, it's returning to an, a time when people yeah. had to be commercially successful. Yeah, you know, I think that's a really great point. And it also, I think, speaks to like larger trends in our culture, which is if we think of, you know, things like economic inequality in the United States or the idea of a kind of of the United States as a as a welfare state that allows for a middle class to emerge by the government subsidizing things like a college education for people who, you know, went to fought in World War II, the GI Bill, or the housing bills that were developed in the 1950s and 60s, or the, um, you know, the Great Society that Lyndon Johnson set out to set out to create. You know, America was a very, um, the United States was was a very income it, unequal country, you know, as, as like, if you read Thomas Piketty's work, right, um, until the post-war decades. And the post-war decades were this period of the flourishing economically of a new kind of middle class, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, propped up by all this government support um, of college educations. Now, obviously, this is a very racialized thing. This was often building a white middle class, not um, at the expense of an African-American middle class. Um, but we can kind of see the NEA as part of that, as and also the idea of a kind of nonprofit cultural sector, which emerges in the 1950s and 60s, both in anticipation of the NEA and in response to the NEA. So the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation become these huge supporters of contemporary music in the 1950s and 60s. Um, Michael Wee, uh, his last name is UY, has an amazing book about this that came out uh, just this past year um, that looks at uh, the big bang for, for music funding. Do you want to is say something? The, yeah. Is it the 1950s and 60s or is it the 60s and 70s? I know the 70s saw a huge boom in the establishment of new nonprofit sectors. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought the 50s were still robust enough. I know that the, the Chicago Symphony Orchestra as recently as the 70s saw it as a failure if they only sold 50,000 copies of a recording. And of right, course- Right, right. Well, the record industry, right, was this actual for-profit player in classical music, right? That that was, right. the record industry was structuring a lot of what the, I mean, you know more about this than I do, what, what the orchestras were doing. Um, Rockefeller Foundation and Ford Foundation um, are, are beginning to fund contemporary music specifically in the 50s and early 60s. So for example, when Babbitt writes his, who cares if you listen, essay in 58, um, he is starting to work as a consultant, and this is all in, in, in Michael's fantastic book, uh, which is called Ask the Experts. Um, uh, he's starting to work as a consultant for the Rockefeller Foundation and helping them basically seed contemporary music sec, um, centers in universities all around the country. And this is leads to this whole academic scene, Rockefeller money, which is basically Cold War money. Um, you know, the larger context for this is that Babbitt and his colleagues are able to tap into this idea that if music, if they present music as a kind of scientific mathematical phenomenon, you know, the math and science in the in the country is getting funded by this post Sputnik moment. So they they're able to tap into this Cold War uh, ethos and thus Cold War kind of money. Um, so all these all these little Rockefeller funded new music centers around the country that have electronic music, you know, often academic composers, um, are are kind of propped up. The NEA. Um, funds a lot of that stuff later. Um, and then all this kind of, basically this infrastructure emerges. Now, Bang & Can emerges, you know, they use all of that infrastructure. It's not like they turn that, the, any of that infrastructure down. It's And then they begin to find these other kind of pathways. Um, you know, Glass and Reich didn't use that. Um, but on the other hand, by the 1970s, Glass, uh, Reich starts applying for NEA grants um, and, and those fund some of his projects in the 1980s too. And Glass, of course, remained the commercial powerhouse. For, I mean, a commercially viable operation, shall we say, for yes, for yes, via I think film. To I mean, you know, if we think of his nonprofit, you know, right, Einstein. If we think of you know Satyagraha and the st his work of the eighties being primarily you know funded through some kind of nonprofit system, it's the film work that is that is making the money that allows him to 
be a kind of quote unquote marketplace composer, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as for Bang and a Can, uh, you talk about the All Stars being a touring arm that could bring in money. I was curious how much money the tours actually brought in. When I got to Washington in 2008, I remember they did a Bang on a Can marathon at University of Maryland. And um, oh, right, right, right. Went to cover it and was all excited. And and it was a whole different ball game from New York. I'd been to the marathons in New York, and it was, I mean, it was a polite audience, but it wasn't the same kind mm. of excitement. It wasn't the same kind of buzz. It had to be explained to a lot of people. It was just a different phenomenon. And That's it was the first time I saw that it was sort of much more of a New York centric thing than I thought. Obviously they've had success around the country, but I just wondered how much actually was coming in through touring mm. and what that did for them. Yeah, you know, I only trace this through the 90s. And so, you know, they begin unlocking these significant tours by the late 1990s. And they do a bunch of, I think, sold out tours that were national and international around 1999 and 2000 around their Music for Airports project, which was kind of, this was the thing that really put them on the map nationally and internationally, which was uh, the three founding composers, as well as the composer Evan Zipporin, um, created a live arrangement of Brian Eno's very famous 1978 ambient album, Music for Airports, and they toured this and they recorded it um, for the label Point Music. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I didn't, I don't think I have audience demographics for outside New York concerts, although I'm pretty sure that most of the shows for those um, runs did sell out. But, you know, I think as far as what happens nationally and internationally now, like there are very few, I think, new music performers who will sell out a concert outside of their home city necessarily. But the, I, the, the fact that they can even put together a tour that's presented not by an academic university, but by, or not necessarily, let's say not a music department, but by some network of, of presenters, whether that's the Library of Congress or, um, you know, University of Maryland's presenting the Clarice, they're presenting Wing, or whether that's um, the Phillips collection, like that's that's about as successful as you can get, I think, is, is if you can be kind of full-time touring or, or almost full-time touring. Um, well, of course, the Kronos Quartet created the model for that. Yes. This is a breakout new music mm -hmm. group that, that was able to do it. But, but another thing that I wondered reading the book is that you write a little bit about their, you do write about their music, but this is mostly a book about bang on a can as an institution and, and the yeah. marketplace, as you say. What what are your thoughts about how their music evolved? I mean, you talk about the rock influence building up and now they're in very different places than they were starting out. Um, and, and do you think about focusing on that more in future work or did you choose mm -hmm. not to focus it on, on this work? Yeah, it was, I wanted to make sure that I always addressed the three composers as composers in the book, but I also knew it was not going to be a main focus because there were just so many other things I wanted to tackle. Um, and so you do get a sense of how their individual voices grew and changed. And in part, that's because I did, I started the book, you know, the book starts with the biographies of them going back to their childhood a little bit to get a sense of their musical tastes and influences. And and that seems so necessary to understand what Bang and Ken became. And, you know, again, because the book ends 20 years ago, their music has all, they, they have all changed and grown so much as individual composers. The idea that the the composer who wrote Cheating, Lying, Stealing, this kind of like rock centric, breakbeat heavy, like instrumental kind of tricky rhythm ensemble work in 1992, David Lang is the composer who wrote The Little Match Girl Passion, this very haunting choral work is, is, is kind of, um, bonkers but actually you know david lang of the three of them i think is actually the most consistent in terms of the, the, the his compositional methods have remained almost the same i think since the 1980s and 90s which is this kind of he he's very interested in these kind of like very um very precise mathematical combinations of rhythms and pitches which can yield something that's very harsh but can also yield something that's very beautiful it's very interesting um and you know i think Wolf's music has has become more and more interested in in they've all become more interested in theater in different ways. But you know, in the last few years, she's been writing these kind of massive historical oratorios on topics like the Triangle Shirt Waste Fire, um, Pennsylvania coal mining, uh, Anthracite Fields, which was at the Kennedy Center. Some of you may have been there a couple of years ago. It's really and won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and Gordon, I think, has to a certain degree been kind of the most maybe straight line of the three of them in terms of 
Um, you know, he's always been interested in kind of combinations of, of like very complicated combinations of rhythms that yield this very kind of like abstract textures. If you, if you listen to things like that, he's been working on more recently, like rushes or timber, these really amazing kind of um, like take six bassoons in rushes, six or eight bassoons and create this kind of like almost Steve Reich's like series of pulsating cascading rhythms. Um, and he's done some amazing collaborations with with um, Bill Morris. And it's also hard to write about their music post 2000 because they are all so insanely prolific. Um, like if you look at their catalogs and I did go, especially from the eighties to the two thousands, but I tried to go further than that. I basically listened to every, tried to get the score for every single piece I could and listened to everything to really at least try to trace, try to at least chart the trajectory as much as I could for each of them. It was a lot, it's a lot of stuff. Um, uh, I don't know how David Lang manages to compose as much as he composes, but he does. And, and the other two of them are, are pretty uh, frequent uh, composed as well, but yeah. I get the sense they've all become larger scale too, that they've all become more theatrical and David, David like Julia has also gone into more research sort of all pieces and, spent time in libraries. I remember his excitement at, uh, at delving into original sources for a piece. And, uh, and um, I, I, one of my introductions to them was the carbon copy building, which was mm, one of the collaborative yes. works where everybody in the audience was like, can you tell who wrote what? And of course I had no idea who wrote what, and I still couldn't really tell who wrote what, but, uh, but they used to do collaborations and I don't think they're doing that anymore, are they? <laughs> Uh, not recently. There were a couple of those, you know, Shelter and Lost Objects in the 2000s. Oh, no, they did actually Road, I think it's called Road Movies, which was, or Road Something, happened a few years ago at BAM, which was a, like a 30th anniversary show um, that was a similar kind of uh, movements from each of them. Um, but that also, you know, I think what's so fascinating about them is that they are three composers, and this is part of kind of how they talk about themselves, that have been you know, not just very close friends, Gordon and Wolf have been married since the 1980s, but, uh, and and Lang and Gordon were best friends basically from when they met, kind of encountered, re-encountered re each other at Yale and, until the present. Um, and they've always been kind of exchanging musical ideas back and forth, not just in pieces that they write together, but, you know, they compose together. It's it, it's very clear that, you know, the, the theatrical interest that's happening in David Lang's music is certainly affecting uh, Julie Wolf's music and vice versa. Um, and so, you know the fact that somehow in the in the you know post 2015 they all seem to write these like 90 minute theatrical works that have some kind of historical component like that can't be a coincidence um but it's, it's so interesting too um you don't often see that well of course they're getting the commissions too when the new york philharmonic right yes. wants to write a big piece you have a lot of incentive to write something really big and make that's make true yeah this is um and there's been some really exciting work um, it's interesting to me that given that one of your original interests was the composers who who influenced who were they who were influenced by them, sorry, yes. um, that you don't that you stop before you get to the institute because the institute seems to have become a real institution in, in training young musicians in becoming an academy for this particular brand of irreverent DIY um, music and and approach. For sure. And, you know, they, so they, they have the Summer Institute beginning in 2002, I think, at, at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, which is in the Berkshires. And if you've ever been there, it's this massive, um, you know, museum complex of, of contemporary work. Um, and, you know, the, the first kind of couple classes of, of the composers and performers who went there in like 2002 to 2004 all became significant people in the world of new music. Judd Greenstein, David T. Liddell, Missy Mazzoli, a um, bunch of others whose names I'm forgetting. Uh, and and my, my dissertation kind of actually really starts there as a kind of focal point for what ends up happening. Um, and now, you know, I, I it's what's interesting is it's hard to make the case of like, did these people did these composers who come out of this institute become learn how to be successful via the summer program or do they go to the summer program because they're interested in that thing and they're already kind of knowing how to do it and then they make some connections and, and they go on and, and you know a lot more research would have to be done to figure that out which i'm uh, probably won't do but um i have had the uh, fortunate um opportunity to be um two or I guess three summers ago now, Bang & Can started a media workshop, which, you know, the, the summer workshop is for young composers and performers. They started a media workshop for, and I shouldn't say young, actually, I should say, probably say emerging, um, for uh, writers and, and people who wanted to do coverage of contemporary music. And so John Schaefer and I have been faculty there for two summers and then not last summer because of COVID. Um, uh, 
And so I've been able to kind of see a bit more of how the Summer Institute works. And it's really interesting to see who comes to the Institute, what they're interested in, how Bang on a Can kind of um, figures out ways for them to do different kinds of collaborative projects together. Um, some of the some of the ways in which there are kind of structures built into the Summer Institute that that go back to Bang on a Can from the beginning, which is, you know, they're very open minded about who they um, who they're interested in 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 apply who applies to the Summer Institute, and you know they don't get an orchestra every summer or something like that. They they like to say like if four oboists apply and they're all really interesting, we'll take four oboists. But they do have separate applications for composers and performers. Um, which is a little bit unusual because so many contemporary musicians today are composer performers. But back in the 1980s when Bang & Ken got started, part of how they kind of all thought of themselves artistically is they thought of themselves as composers of notated music for performers to play. Gordon was a little bit of an exception because he did play in his ensemble. But you know, the Bang & Ken All-Star started in 1992. It did not include the three Bang & Ken founders. It included six classically trained musicians who played the founders' music. Um, and that goes back to this kind of complicated question of who, bang, who, what is Bang on a Can? Because when most people see Bang on a Can on tour, they're seeing the ensemble that's not the founding composers. Um, and so there's interesting kind of divisions between composer and performer that I kind of trace throughout the book and you see informing what they do today as well. That's an excellent point because the whole DIY aesthetic, which I wanted to ask you about is, is linked up to that question. I just want to mention to everybody watching that um, as we approach the end of our time, if you have questions for Will, um, please feel free to type them into the chat and we will uh, we will address them. Um, will, what I wanted to ask you was about um, the idea that the DIY aesthetic is relatively new and sort of begins with bang on a can. I remember um, Joseph Polizzi, the former president of Juilliard saying that for in his mind, the DIY thing goes back to the classical era when, you know, Schubert sure. had to put together an yeah. orchestra to hear his stuff and that it was a really great thing for the students to be doing this again, that it was unfortunate to be too reliant on other groups. And, um, but I never stopped to think that the bang on a can composers don't play, um, you know, because Philip Glass did take part in yeah. his ensemble. Steve Reich took part in his ensemble. Um, do you think that that is more of, a, that they have influenced a more DIY approach or is mm -hmm. that sort of independently of them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think a tension that's always been part of Bang & Ken is the, the a combination of this kind of entrepreneurial DIY model with the fact that they are kind of classical composers in the almost the capital C sense of, of, of at least in the last kind of two decades, not, not performing their own music generally with, with Gordon being sometimes the exception to that. Um, and so, you know, younger musicians don't typically like there's all kinds of younger ensembles that have, you know, it's, there's a bajillion young ensembles in, that play new music. And I'm using young in quotes because a lot of these people are now in their forties and fifties, um, if not older, um, where you don't necessarily see it being run by composers who are outside the group. It's often, you know, this kind of more collective activity where the people it's run by performers or com combination of composers and performers who are in the group. And, you know, as to going back to Schubert, like I always, I, one thing that I found kind of tricky with the book is like, I, I try to root things as much in the U S as possible because it's like, when we talk about classical music in Europe in the 19th century, it often is not a useful paradigm to talk about, classical music in the 21st century US. Uh, and so like, I maybe it's worth saying like, it goes back to William Billings or something like that, you know, early American composer who, who, who uh, you know, puts out his own, uh, publishes his own music or whatever. Um, uh, but, you know, one thing that I think is, people think of the minimalists as being this first kind of generation of composers who start their ensembles or whatever. But again, like that's what American composers have always done. And even the so-called academics like they were sure they taught at academic universities and they had academic patronage, but they also started their own groups, like the group for contemporary music. Like that was entrepreneurial in its own way too, although they may have played music that not a lot of people wanted to hear. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's always, and this is kind of the case that I make it towards the end of the book is like, it's always been a nonprofit endeavor. It's always been a DIY endeavor. Um, it's never been a, it's, it's, it's the United States. It's not Europe. It's never been state supported in, in a way that was sufficient enough for it, for it to be state supported on its own. Um, and Europe is now becoming less like that too, um, which is, I think, a problem. Well, sure. The whole model continues to evolve, but, yeah. uh, but I suppose the, the comparison to Schubert is more from the point of view of a 
Juilliard president where people are yes, coming. Yes. To Juilliard. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think uh, he's talking much about William Billings and his, no, his no. notes. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, to think that it is exclusively an American invention for scrappy composers to come in and invent their own stuff is uh, is not entirely yeah, accurate. Yeah, either. that's a great point. Uh, let me see if I can. Uh, yeah, do we have any questions? Uh, that I we saw one flash up, but no. Uh, uh, Doug, Doug Shadel's making some fun comments in the chat, which is nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Did anybody, oh, here's a question. Which music hmm. schools have bang on a can like new music ensembles? I'll That's a great question. That because Juilliard, Juilliard does not, I believe. <laughs> yeah, there are, in the last few years I have seen, and I, I can't name them off the top of my head, um, conservatories or or music schools in some capacity who have started some kind of ensemble that it is kind of like there's I can't remember someone started a kind of why music style ensemble why music being a kind of amplified chamber group in this in this mode um you know more often what you see is that most conservatories or um music schools have some kind of new music ensemble on campus broadly speaking um which is you know, sometimes it's run by graduate students, sometimes it's part of the larger ensemble experience, and they will sometimes play works for a Bang on a Can instrumentation, like a work written for the Bang on a Can All-Stars in the 1990s, and assemble, you know, usually university music ensembles are some hodgepodge of different instruments that they then assemble different configurations for different pieces. Um, there are, I think, few universities that will adopt a, an entire, you know, if you were to fix yourselves with the same instrumentation of the Bang on a Can All-Stars, the Bang and Can All Stars, when they were created, were as a sextet of musicians that had never been performed before uh, together. I'm going to try to do it, and I might mess it up. But bass, piano, electric guitar, cello, reeds, and percussion. Okay, I did it. I I kept messing this up in another talk. Um, and so, if you were to make an ensemble exactly like that, you could only play their repertoire. Um, you know, people are if they're going to write music for that ensemble, um, they're only going to be writing for the All Stars. And you know, part of when Bang and Can created that ensemble back in the 90s, they kind of said apparently early on, they it had they were at first considered a kind of larger chamber group from which you could kind of pluck different instruments, um, but they wanted to have a unique instrumentation to create a unique repertoire to create this kind of, um, I don't wanna say brand, but we might say brand of like a specific sound that they could take on the road that would represent the larger organization. So, you know, the specifics of Bagging the Can's identity is important, I think, to that story as well. It strikes me listening to that, um one of the things about Bang on a Can that, that was so valuable is that it gave composers a kind of band. If you think of what David Lang would have done all on his own as a composer in New York, you would go out and you try to get your commissions and you try to do something, by, but by banding together, they had a kind of composer's ensemble that gave them an identity and a framework in which to develop as artists. And it gave them a kind of authority and freedom that they wouldn't have had individually. Um, yeah, it's almost like, you know, Haydn writing for the Esterhazy Orchestra in a way, right? That's, I hadn't thought about that before, but that's really interesting. And, you know, it's also true that the direction that all three composers go in in the 90s is very much because they had started this organization that they felt like represented their interests in a way that other things were not. Um, and, you know, Lang is the one who really goes in this period of the 90s from being a kind of, he could have had a more traditional academic career. He was having performances of his music by the New York Philharmonic, having performances at Lincoln Center. He got a ton of really important, like, big prizes as a young composer in the 1980s. Um, but he kind of, like, he, he basically takes on the kind of renegade posture um, and kind of, like, almost a band to a certain degree kind of rejects a lot of that um, once Bang and Akin starts and once he realizes that this is kind of the pathway. Um, to a certain degree, he kind of adopts the mold of Michael Gordon, who who had been kind of the more downtown rebellious mavericky um, voice in that period. Um, and of course, the fact that they all end up kind of back in the academy by the 2000s is is the, you know, kind of said, said, says something too about that. Somebody says, what are some of the lessons that presenters can glean from Bang on a Can's model for stabilizing uh, in the years ahead with the impact of COVID and the financial mm -hmm. crisis, when of course the, the DIY issue yeah. is going to be prevalent for all of us? Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. I'm I'm hesitant to say that there's, you know, a secret that I unlocked in my book that's going to save the arts. Um, you know, I the one thing that I kind of, one of the takeaways I have is that, you know, the public funding that was gutted in the 90s should not have been gutted and, and needs to be restored much more robustly before we can have 
uh, uh, you know, uh, a, um, a healthy arts ecosystem again in the United States. Um, and, you know, I think the, the ability to adapt for Bang & Can has always been there. Um, and, you know, that's in part because they didn't have, you know, unlike some other composers or, or institutions, they've never had a concert hall that they had to pay rent on. You know, they were always a rotating organization and they could always be as kind of as scale as big or as small as, as the times demanded. Um, and so that's what they're doing now with, you know, presenting online marathons and getting commissions for younger composers. But um, I think it's a very hard, it was a hard time before the pandemic hit. And, and it, for me, it's kind of hard to imagine how things emerge. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm kind of just scared and ho also hopeful that musicians will be able to figure it out. Um, that's, I think, one of those areas where the musicians know more than more, more than the academics. But I would throw in that I think that classical music has been too allied with some of these big institutions for too long, and that having an example like Bang on a Can of creating your own institution, going against the prevalent moments of the day and showing how you can make something viable is a really valuable moment for COVID because I'm hoping that post COVID we see different kinds of institutions, which I think will serve the field much better. Bang yeah. on a can develop an institution and a lot of creativity, which larger classical music institutions have not always been known for. Yeah, um, that's, that's a great point as well. Yeah. And in that, in that sense, it's kind of a model. Mm -hmm. but, but. Well, we're running low on time. Will, is there any point at the book, like what is your favorite sort of section of the book or what's a section of the book you hope people will really mm -hmm. take yeah, away? That's, oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, the funding chapter, I think is the one that kind of says the most important stuff that's relevant beyond just kind of the new music world. Um, but I also really like the record industry chapter, which is the final chapter, because it traces this kind of bizarre and strange moment where um, uh, this symphony by this composer, Henrik Goretzky, uh, obscure Polish composer, sells a million copies um, in the 1990s. And suddenly every major label is like, we got to find some new music. And Bang on a Can kind of traipses through this. Because um, it's just like one of those bizarre stories um, that, that uncovering and kind of fleshing out in all its detail was really fun to do and to understand what's going on at the kind of big level, but also what's going on at the kind of individual level of these three composers. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I, I really enjoyed writing this book and like, I, I hope that it works as a narrative. It, it moves chronologically and narratively through, through a couple decades. And um, yeah, I'm just curious to hear what folks think of it as they read it. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hold it up so you can see. Industry of Atlanta and New Music in the Marketplace. Buy it at Loyalty Books or rent it uh, from, from your local library. Well, I, I certainly enjoy reading it and I've enjoyed talking to you. I see we have a couple more questions. Do we have time to go over a little bit to get the last couple of audience questions? I'm going to take that silence as a yes and Great. say, and say um, somebody asks that you've spoken to a lot of people in the research for this. Did you ever encounter a case where the sources from multiple, hmm. where stories from multiple sources didn't quite add up? Yes, that is a, a great question from uh, a great musicologist. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, and yes, uh, there are a lot of instances because, you know, I tried to look at this as not um, as a case of basically, especially finding conflicts between archival materials and what the Bangana Can founders have told me about things um, as a case of Gordon Lang and Wolf have been telling the same stories about their organization for more than 30 years. And they're bound to have added in mistakes or their own personal interpretations or their own kind of mythologies into it 20 years ago and kept it the same way. Um, and so when I found discrepancies, I kind of note them and make clear what's interesting about those discrepancies. Um, one of the most obvious and simple ones, but was re very revealing for me, and I talked very briefly about it in the book, was um, the Bang and I Can the first Bang on a Can Marathon was billed in 1987 as the first annual Bang on a Can Marathon. Um, and when they talk about this now, they say that was a joke because how crazy would it be to do this again? Like it was kind of like, let's call it the first annual because that would be so funny. And when they talk about starting, going from one marathon to a second marathon and ultimately to a bigger organization, um, they frequently, um, you know, this is a story that I just saw recounted recently somewhere, um, will say that when they were, um, cleaning up after the first marathon and then, you know, probably at 2 a.m. and they were folding up folding chairs and sweeping up in the in this downtown art gallery. They they said, we should do this again. This was so fun. Um, and that's a, a great story that kind of emblematizes a certain kind of, you know, entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, a, a, like we did this and we want to do it again and it was fun. And, you know, we, we had this revelation late at night. But um, uh, 
when I got um, one of the really interesting archival sources I got was from the New York State Council on the Arts. Um, I got all these grant materials. Um, and so I saw that in 1987, a couple months before the first annual Diana Ken Marathon, they had applied for a grant for the second annual Diana Ken Marathon. So, you know, that again, that story has obviously personal truth for them, but in fact, they had been thinking, they had been thinking quite strategically about what the second one looked like before the first one even happened. And so it's those moments that I think are really always fascinating for scholars. They're always fun to find. Um, you know, sometimes some of that stuff I would go back to them with and be like, so can you kind of square this? And a lot of it would be like, I, you know, I don't remember, sure. Uh, you know, whatever. But um, yeah, that, that's one of those moments. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Those always come up in, yep. in general, certainly. Um, and somebody else asked quickly, did you discover any relationships or conflicts or crossover between Tanglewood and the Bang on a Can Festival, which was affectionately known as Banglewood, yes. but I believe they had to stop calling it Banglewood, so that might be part oh, of the really? answer. Oh, really? I think it's still informally known as Banglewood, but it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, so these are two music festivals that happen in the Berkshires in the summer. Tanglewood has its own contemporary music festival, uh, Tanglewood being the home of the BSO, uh, Boston Symphony. Um, and, you know, they're not, they're within an hour's drive of each other. Um, you know, I, when I was in grad school, I went to a Tanglewood concert and a Banglewood marathon on in the same day, I think. Um, and so, you know, they very much presented themselves as the kind of anti-Tanglewood. That was how they kind of saw the institution from the beginning. Um, Lang had actually gone to Tanglewood as a young composer in the early 1980s and done, you know, quite quite well there as he was kind of firmly kind of within that camp in that period. Um, and the way that they will often talk about this is like Tanglewood is this kind of very, at that time in the 80s and 90s, it was very closed off aesthetically. Um, and they actually returned to Tanglewood. Um, and this is maybe an instance of the of some of the conflicts. Um, they kind of returned to Tanglewood in 1994. The All Stars plays at Tanglewood because Louis Andreessen was composer in residence and invited them. And this was one of the first time any kind of minimalist or post minimalist music was heard at Tanglewood, because the composer Gunther Schiller, who oversaw Tanglewood in the 1980s, um, basically said no minimalism. Uh, I like straight up just said no minimalism, and there he fought with the patron. Um, who sponsored the entire festival and ultimately decided to, the patron pulled out Paul Fromm because of the no minimalism thing. Um, anyway, they return to Tangled. They finally go to Tangled with the All-Stars in 1994. It's, you know, this concert, there's video of it um, in their archives that, that's um, fun to watch. And apparently um, Leonard Fleischer, um, no, sorry, Leon Fleischer uh, had his ears, has fingers stuck in his ears for the whole concert because uh, it was amplified. And, and so, you know, there's there's obviously this, you know, they see themselves as the kind of renegades and to a certain degree in, in those moments, they certainly uh, look like it, yeah. Great, well, I think now we are definitely we are out, of time. out of time. And and again, thank you so much for talking about the book and for writing a book. And uh, it was a delight to get to talk to you about it. And I hope everybody will go out and read it. Thank you so much, Anne. This was such a lovely conversation. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to the library. Uh, it's, a, it's a real great honor to do local local events with the library. Yeah, thank you uh, so much to both of you, Will and Anne. This is a really wonderful conversation. Um, we really encourage everyone to support Will and support Loyalty Bookstores by purchasing a copy. Um, if you are not interested in purchasing a copy, that's okay too. We can get it for you through the library, through our Marina service. Just uh, visit pgcmos.info and go up to services and uh, navigate to Marina. And uh, we hope that you continue to follow us at PGCMLS. The next event that I'd like to just shout out, shout out for everyone um, is Wednesday, March 3rd. Uh, choreographer Lorianne Gibson, who has worked with everyone from Janet Jackson to Beyonce and Lady Gaga, will be joining us with uh, Lorenzo Evans, who's a local arts executive and professor at American University. Super excited. We have more events all day long, every day, uh, pretty much for the kids and everyone in between. And uh, you can access all of our ebooks and audiobooks. Even if you don't live in the area, you can get a virtual library card now because it's COVID time and it's special. So uh, take advantage of the much shorter wait times with our library than DC Public and uh, the Maryland Consortium if you're that much of a nerd. So uh, thank you so much again, and uh, we hope you can join us again soon.